Hey, this is Mike North, and for today's Ember debugging adventure, we're going to walk through the process by which an Ember application boots up. Just a reminder, much of what we're going to walk through today is a private API, meaning they, they are the internals of the Ember framework. Uh, you're probably going to have a really bad time if you decide to you know, start accessing some of this stuff and manipulating it. Uh, because it could change at any time. So this is really to improve people's understanding of what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, certainly not, uh, you know, licensed to go and use it and uh, customize it beyond the, the public means of customizing it. So the way an Ember application starts booting, uh, it begins with a subclass of the Ember dot application type, and the process starts with this underscore boot sync method, which typically, for the vast majority of Ember apps, um, that will be called when a DOM ready event fires. So if you're used to jQuery, this is like your jQuery ready. This means that all of the JavaScript has been downloaded and parsed, and we're kind of ready to start um, operating on a fully formed DOM. So the first thing that happens um, inside the boot sync method, and this is a summary of what happens. I've stripped a lot of code out while trying to preserve uh, the, the intent and the ideas that, um, that are present here. Uh, but one of the first things we do is run through the list of initializers. And if you've ever worked with initializers before, you know that these are um, you know, modular pieces of how your Ember app boots up. So these are uh, functions that are, you know, basically arranged in a queue uh, and they're run in order. This is what an initializer might look like. And, you know, right away you can see that uh, it's sort of a, f a function that is wrapped with a thin object. Um, so the function is typically where the interesting stuff happens. Um, the other things present on the object are just the ability to name this initializer and then to position it before or after another initializer that may be present in the stack. So initializers are run while the application is booting. And I like to think of this uh, almost like constructor type logic. So if you have experience working with um, C or Java or any language like that, where you, you're dealing with constructors, uh, anything that happens in this kind of function where you're, you're sort of setting up a brand new instance of an object, uh, you can't rely on that instance being well formed yet. And that logic sort of applies to initializers. For example, you cannot depend on having a container yet. Um, there, there are many things that are, are not quite there, um, which, you know, in an action handler of a component like way downstream, you know, you, you're used to an app looking a particular way and you're missing some things as you go through the initializers because oftentimes initializers are the process of setting those things up. Because initializers are run as part of the boot process, we actually have the opportunity to, uh, to pause that boot process while we wait for something asynchronous to complete. And that is done by way of two methods called defer readiness and advance readiness. Uh, under the hood, all this is doing is essentially uh, it's, it's managing a counter where you know deferring will increase the counter by one, advancing will decrease the counter by one, and then if if that count is at zero, you know the boot process will proceed. Uh, a good use case for this, where you might want to wait on something asynchronous, would be potentially if you have some critical value in uh, index DB that you might use for like AB testing. Uh, so index DB, because it's locally, you know, it's on the user's machine, very fast to access, but it is, it does have an asynchronous API. And so although it would be very quick to wait on something, you do still need to wait for, you know, that, that callback as part of the index DB API to, to be invoked uh, before you'll actually have a handle on that value. So uh, when, when we're dealing with initializers, I want you guys to have a clear distinction between registry and container. Uh, when I think of registry, this is where all of your factories live. When you're writing like ember.route.extend, 
that that is returning a factory uh, and and the registry is where those things typically live the container is where instances of things live so when we think about like singletons for example uh, you know the the singleton instances live in a container uh, registry is sort of the stateless part of your application and the container is often where state lives uh, when we start diving into how this works and and uh, touch on instance initializers, we will see some important distinctions that uh, have very significant consequences uh, when we when we think about things like fast boot or running tests that that pertain to registry versus container. So essentially, when we're done uh, running through all of our initializers, we call advanced readiness for the last time. And if you haven't deferred at this point, you know the counter will be at zero. And you know when the counter is at zero, we then call this function. You know, did become ready, and this is sort of the last steps that happen um, before your application is considered to be booted. Ninety-nine percent of the time, like the vast majority of Ember apps out there, uh, auto boot, meaning they uh, start the process that you know results in stuff being rendered rendered on the screen. Uh, they start that absolutely as soon as it possibly can. There are situations, particularly if you're migrating from some legacy thing to Ember, where you might have to like wait on some surrounding stuff to happen before your app boots. So if you've got like a Backbone app and you want to render your Ember app inside a Backbone view, you kind of have to wait for a Backbone to do its thing and then explicitly tell Ember that like, I want to start this application now and render yourself inside this div. So that would be like, you know, opting out of the auto boot mode. But like the vast majority of the time we are auto booting. So uh, once we start to boot, like once we, we enter the process of beginning to boot here, we first create an application instance, which is different from an application. And the way I like to think of this is that the application instance that contain that has to do with like this concept of a container, um, the stateful portion of your application, whereas the Ember dot application that is sort of the factories, right? That's the stateless portion of your application. And um, I, I told you I would connect this to Fastboot, so so here it is. So when you're rendering, when you're using server side rendering by way of Fastboot, uh, you have a number of processes that will spin up in your little Node.js server. And uh, the, the Ember application will actually be preserved and reused across many requests. The application instance is created and then destroyed um, on a per request basis. So, so when you consider that, you can see that like putting state on the Ember application or in the registry, uh, that would cause some data or state to potentially leak between requests, which would be a bad thing, right? If you had a password and it was stored in the registry instead of the container, then you would be in a situation where like the next request would get the prior requests, you know, secret data. And obviously that's a bad thing. So here, you know, this, this separation of application and application instance is, is really nice and lets us kind of throw the portion away that we need to and keep the portion that we can get away with keeping. So we are going to uh, first, you know, build the this application instance. And then uh, at this point, we're going to start the application instances boot process. Now, in terms of what happens in there, um, we first set up the registry and that uh, it's not not all that interesting, but important because, you know, the container and the registry are, cre are uh, connected in that you know, when you ask the container for a service, for example, and that service hasn't been instantiated yet, it needs to go and get the factory for it. Um, so that's part of what this this phase of the process does. Um, we define the root element and location of the Ember app uh, so that, you know, we basically know where we're going to render and what type of things to listen to uh, to detect navigation throughout our app. You know, it might be that we're using the HTML5 history stack, or we're using hash change events, or if we're in testing mode, you know, we're listening to like JavaScript 
like member data that's changing in memory and there's no representation of it in the URL. Um, but whatever that is, you know, we set the location up. And now we're going to begin the process of uh, initializing this application instance, right? This is the stateful piece of our app. And this is where instance initializers come into play. So like non-instance initializers, these are modular pieces of a boot process. Um, it's important to understand that at this point, your, your application already exists. You have a container. Um, so, so you can think of it as like your app has just booted. This is, you can think of this as almost stuff you would put inside um, like an init hook where it's sort of like post creation setup logic. Uh, as, I, as I described earlier, these instance initializers are called on a per request basis when you're server side rendering with Fastboot. Uh, when you're running your acceptance tests, these are like the containers basically torn down and recreated and your you know, instance initializers will be rerun um, on a per acceptance test basis. So important to keep that in mind, uh, you know, which is run which of the initializers are run one time versus like on a per test number of times. When you're dealing with the instance initializers, uh, this is where you have access to a container and you're dealing with stateful aspects of your app. Um, so you can think in terms of a container uh, as opposed to having just the registry to work with. So after we're done running these inst instance initializers, uh, we're going to only if we're in interactive mode, set up our event dispatcher. An example of not being in interactive mode would be if you are server-side rendering, right? We don't need to listen for clicks and keystroke events uh, if we are, you know, rendering, rendering our Ember app uh, in Node.js. There is no user there to interact with it. Um, so, we, so we basically can uh, opt out of the overhead required to listen for those events and propagate them to the appropriate um, objects that need to care about them. So if we're running on the client and we need to listen for clicks and stuff, we will set up our global event dispatcher. And at this point, we're done with this boot sync method, right? We've, we've basically booted the application instance. The final thing that happens here is we begin routing, right? We're gonna start our first transition and get the router to sort of pick up uh, managing, you know, that URL-based application state. So that begins by just getting the initial URL from the location. And remember, location is just the thing that, like, uh, it, it provides us a URL listening to some source of truth, right? It could be, like, getting a URL from the hash change event or getting a URL from the, uh, you know, HTML5 history API, but this is ultimately what we're going to use in order to sort of normalize all of that and uh, tell our router what to do. And so, like within the router, then we begin this uh, initial transition, and we're going to tell it to handle the URL. And at this point, you know, we're we're uh, in the same territory as a normal route transition, and you know, downstream from this point, things kind of behave as you would expect. So just to kind of highlight some important things that we've touched on here, uh, we talked about the application versus the application instance, right? The stateless versus the stateful part of our app, um, the initializers versus the in instance initializers. This is an incredibly important distinction to make. Now, in terms of giving you some practical things that you can do with this newfound knowledge, um, the first thing is knowing how to see which initializers are available, right? This is very important if you are trying to position your initializer in your app or your add-on in the right place. You kind of need to know, like, well, what are the available options? So the way we do this is that we're going to uh, create a new initializer uh, just for the purpose of investigation here. And you're just going to put a debugger inside the initialize function. And then once you're sort of frozen at this, you know, frame in the code, um, you can go a couple stack frames up and uh, you will find a for loop that iterates over the entire 
array of initializers. And this is great because now you can see what your various options are in terms of like where you can position yourself before or after. You can do the same thing with instance initializers. You see like it's, it is the same mechanism by which you know we, we process through this list of, uh, of things. It's just a different bucket of initializers that, that's run. So this is in fact like the same place where you're gonna wanna stop, you're gonna wanna put a breakpoint. In terms of debugging the registry, um, the easiest way to do this without getting too creative about uh, setting breakpoints in special spots is to use the in Ember inspector uh, to grab a hold of your uh, of the instance of your Ember application. And so here you would click on the uh, the container menu item on the on the left, and then under types you would pick application, and then you click on main because there's only one you know application for you to pick. And then you'll click this dollar sign E thing in the top right corner, which will assign that object to a global so that you, you can access it in the console. And then we can call this resolve registration method on it. So here you can see that I am uh, you know, reaching into the registry and grabbing this instance initializer. Uh, and, and you can see that like, what I get back looks very similar to what one would export in an instance initializer file. So additional things that you can do is, uh, well, well, first I want you to see that what you get back from this resolve registration um, function is it is a factory, right? It is not an instance, right? So here you can see that we're getting the store service, which is something that Ember Data um, provides. But what we get back is a subclass of Ember service. We do not get back the instance uh, of that store service that we could, you know, get and set stuff on, right? So, so in this, at this point, we don't even know if one has, has been created yet. Maybe nothing has accessed the store at this point. And uh, we know that services are, are lazily created, you know, just as we ask for them. Uh, the other point I want to highlight here is that we have, uh, we can register options to the registry. Like we can provide options on a per type basis. And the two things that um, you can play with here are uh, whether this thing that has been registered should be treated as a singleton and whether it should be instantiated. So by default, it is assumed that everything in the registry is a factory. And so you can basically like ask for an instance of something and you will get an instance back, right? So we'll go to the factory, we'll grab so we'll go to the registry, we'll grab the appropriate factory, we will call dot create on it to get an instance and uh, you know potentially put that in the container and then hand it back to you. Uh, so instantiate, you can turn that off if you want. Like say if you were just placing a vanilla JavaScript object in the registry, there is no dot create there and so you'd run into trouble if it were treated like a factory. Um, the second option, singleton, basically tells uh, the framework whether you want the same instance to be returned every time you ask for it or whether you want a new fresh instance to be created whenever you ask for one. So in this case we can see that for components we do not treat them as singletons and as we know you know services, routes, controllers, a couple other objects are singletons, components are not. So here we can see like singleton false this is where that that singletonness is handled. In terms of debugging the container, the easiest place to do this is uh, double underscore off of the application instance and then dot lookup. Um, you can also use the get owner API. And I want to show you the difference between looking up an instance and looking up a factory because we have a lookup and lookup factory. And in this case, for something like templates, um, it, it is less easy to see compared to like what we saw in the earlier slide with services. See, it's less easy to discern between the instance and the factory. Um, the sure way to tell between which is which is to see if there is a dot create method um, on whatever is returned. And you can see here that like lookup factory returns us something with a dot create and lookup, you know, does not. I don't have that line here for you, but uh, take my word for it. If we just did lookup template application dot create, we would get undefined back. So I hope this has been useful for you and uh, keep a lookout for the next Ember debugging adventure.